Mr Philip Hammond. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate today and to make the case to the House for backing the Prime Minister's Brexit deal, ensuring a smooth and orderly departure from the European Union, delivering on the referendum decision of the British people and at the same time securing a close economic and security partnership with our nearest neighbours and most important trading partners. And to make the case for rejecting the calls, both of those who would prefer to plunge the country into the uncertainty and economic self-harm of no deal, and of those who would seek to undo the referendum decision, and in doing so fuel a narrative of betrayal which would undermine the broad consent on which our democratic politics is based. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Just a good way. During the, uh, recently, the Chancellor said that backing the Prime Minister's deal will be better for the country than remaining in the EU. Yet back in February 2016, during the referendum campaign, he said a yes vote would lead to very significant uncertainty and would have a chilling effect on the economy. What information has the Chancellor got that he could share with the rest of us that has caused him to have such a fundamental change of opinion? Well, Mr Speaker, um, I've always recognised that leaving the EU will have an economic cost. What the deal the Prime Minister has negotiated does is minimise that economic cost. We have a nation that is divided on this issue, and I fundamentally believe that we have to bring the country back together in order to succeed as a country in the future. And this deal offers a sensible compromise which protects our economy but delivers on the decision of the British people in the referendum. And my judgment is that if we want to maximise the chances of our nation being successful in the future, this is the right way to go. I give way to my honourable friend. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. Did he subscribe to the statement in the 2017 general election manifesto from the Conservative Party uh, that no deal would be better than a bad deal? Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, and as I've said in this House uh, many times, um, at the beginning of this process, there were people inside the European Union who were contemplating a punishment deal for the United Kingdom, a deal designed to punish us for having the audacity to decide to leave the European Union. Clearly, we could not have accepted uh, such terms for our departure. Uh, I'll give way one more time to my honourable friend and I'll make a little break. I'm very grateful, thank you. The Chancellor mentioned um, at the beginning of his speech no deal. I wonder if you could explain what no deal is, because my understanding is that the rest of the world trades on WTO rules with independent free trade agreements. So there isn't actually any such thing as no deal, is there? Because everybody, well, if we did leave, and I don't buy the language crashing out, we would trade on WTO rules. That's not no deal, surely? Um, yes, Mr Speaker, it is no deal. And, and uh, as I shall say later on in my speech, if we did leave the European Union without a deal, we would actually be the only advanced economy in the world trading with the European Union on pure WTO terms, with no facilitation uh, agreements whatsoever. And in my view, that would be a very, very bad outcome for the United Kingdom. Uh, I'll give way to the right honourable gentleman, and then I will make some progress. I thank him for giving way, and I agree with him that there will inevitably be an economic penalty from leaving the EU. Does he agree that having to comply with lots of rules set by the EU over which we will no longer have any say, which will be the position under the withdrawal agreement, that that is part of the economic penalty that we will suffer? Um, uh, Mr Speaker, it depends very much on what those rules are. Um, uh, the rules are around the, uh, the goods acquis, the part of EU regulation that deals with goods, are very stable and have been for many, many years. We know that our manufacturers in this country will, follow, uh, will continue to follow uh, EU rules on goods, whether we uh, choose to adopt those rules uh, or not. So I think the uh, economic price of having such rules would be very small. In other areas, for example in financial services, where rules uh, are changing very rapidly, where there's a, a great dynamism in the system, there could be much greater dangers for us in being locked in uh, to following rules over which we had no uh, influence. And that's why the deal that we're putting before the House proposes a very different way forward for goods uh, than it does for services and particularly 
financial services. Mr Speaker, I have observed this process at close quarters for two and a half years, and I'm absolutely clear about one thing. This deal is the best deal to exit the EU that is available or that is going to be available. The idea that there is an option of renegotiating at the 11th hour is simply a delusion. We need to be honest with ourselves. The alternatives to this deal are no deal or no Brexit. Either will leave us a fractured, a fractured society and a divided nation. Only the compromise of this negotiated deal, delivering on the referendum result by leaving the EU, ending free movement of people and reasserting our sovereign control over our laws, while at the same time maintaining the closest possible trade, security and cultural links with the European Union to protect our jobs, our living standards and our values, only that compromise can allow our country to move on. Only that compromise can bring us back together after Brexit is delivered. And we should remember the lesson of history, that divided nations are not successful nations. I give way to my honourable friend. Yeah, yeah, I thank yeah, my honourable yeah, friend yeah. for giving way. But does he agree with me it's important that, that we have a deal that is not just only good for the economy, but also one that brings our country together? Yes. And the deal on the table is one that offers that, and it's one that we should move forward with and unite our country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you agree with my honourable friend, and that is the central theme of what I shall say to the House uh, today. Yes, leaving the European Union uh, has a cost, but going back on the decision of the British people would also have an enormous cost for our country. I give way to my honourable friend. Thank you very much. Does my right honourable friend agree that uncertainty is bad for our economy and very bad for businesses? Yes, Mr Speaker, and we, we are already uh, paying a price and have paid a price for the uncertainty uh, around our future trading relationship with the European Union. The sooner, the sooner we can restore certainty, the sooner we can get back onto a path of solid economic growth. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Chancellor, for uh, allowing me to intervene, and he's being very generous with his time. Can the Chancellor clarify as to whether the Government's analysis confirms that this half-baked Brexit deal that the Government are pursuing will actually leave our country permanently poorer? Well, it can't do, because not... um, No, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. In, in all scenarios, we expect that economic growth will continue uh, and the, country, the, the economy will carry on uh, growing. What we are looking at in the analysis we published last week is a ranking order between five different scenarios of their impact on the overall size of the economy, looking out on a 15-year time horizon. Mr Speaker, the, I will in just a moment. Let me make a little progress. Mr Speaker, the theme for today's debate, as you have reminded the House, is the economy. 